We thank you for the Holy Sabbath, and we pray now as we have come together that your Spirit will speak to us. The Seventh-day Adventist message is a sure message. Help us to sense today the certainty of the third angel. May we know that this is not just somebody's opinion, but it definitely comes directly from the throne of God. Help us to understand your word. May we know a little bit more about the principles of interpretation today. We thank you for guiding us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, we have talked a little bit about some of the principles of interpretation. We've talked about the first and the last. You find the first place something's mentioned, and then you find the last place. You find Then you find everything in between. And every time you find some more in between, you're adding more information to what you knew, so that when you get to the end, you'll know everything that God said on that subject. Okay? So it's very important that we find out what God said and not what we think about it or what churches teach. What did God really say? In that amplification, he uses a lot of uh, things. He uses names. Names mean something in the Bible. He uses numbers. The numbers have specific messages. He uses lots of different things. We haven't talked about some of these yet, but what I'm going to, to try to do today is bring some of these principles of interpretation and let's see if we can figure out one text. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to try to understand a little bit more about Revelation 17, verse 11. And please notice... Now we're complete. <laughs> and please notice <laughs> what you are able to say about it right now. And then let's see what you will know about this in an hour and a half. <laughs> okay? Based on what the Bible says. Okay, 1711 Revelation, it says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, please don't raise your hands and don't answer me, but how would you feel right now if I assigned you to a home out here close by to give a Bible study on that text? <laughs> You will be a little bit more prepared in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, we know something about numbers. We know 666. That one jumps out of us. 666. It's the number of what? The Bible says it's the number of a man, right? And we know which man. Now, the number six all by itself is the number of man. Okay, Adam was created on the sixth day, and his number is always six after that. Multiples of six have something to do with mankind. We have the number 144,000. That's six times uh, six plus six, which is 12. 12 times 12 times 10 times. Okay, so you get 144,000, but it's the number six. It's the kingdom of men. <laughs> it's the kingdom of men, six. Now, six, six, six is the world's most imperfect man. Isn't it interesting that lots of people see him as a king, you know, as, a, as the top religionist as the leader as the one everybody loves the bible says he's the world's most imperfect man 
Now there's another number. That number is 888. It's the number of Jesus. Okay, how do we get these numbers? In the Greek language, for example, the word for Jesus is Jesus. And if you take the letters in that word, they have values, each letter. In Latin, it's real easy. What does... That letter mean in numbers. Five, okay? So you know the system. V is five. In English, it's a little harder. In Old English, both those letters have the same value in a number. Now, you don't need to know all the numbers right now. You just need to know there is a system of numbers built into letters. Use the black one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's why you brought it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. So, V equals 5. Um, okay, 7. So, you know how it works with the Latin. In the Hebrew, it's the same thing. You have values for the various letters. In Greek, in all the languages, they have values, okay? So in the Greek, the name Jesus in the Greek language comes out 888. And we want to know what that number means. Why is his number 888 and the papacy is 666? That's our first clue today. Now, we are going to look at these numbers to try to establish what that verse means in Revelation 17, 11. Now, we know something about the papacy and the history. In Revelation 13 and following, it says the papacy would receive a death stroke. Okay? A death stroke. In the original language, it actually means he's killed. In the King James Version, it doesn't quite come out that way. It says he received uh, a wound unto death, King James. But in the original language, it says he was killed. So the papacy is killed. He dies. Well, we see the papacy still around, so what does that mean? <laughs> There was something about the papacy that was killed. Even though there is still a pope. We'll try to understand a little bit more about that as we go along. The reason we want to understand about that death stroke is because Jesus, 888, he was killed. So we've got two that have been killed. Jesus was resurrected. He came back to life. That's what the number eight means. Resurrection. Life, okay? Now the Pope has been killed. And the people think that he's the head of the church. But there's something he can't do today. He used to be able to do. <laughs> He used to be able to say, you're a dead man, and you were dead. <laughs> he can't do that anyway, at least not very easily. <laughs> the papacy in history has always been a persecuting power because it's the devil's church. A persecuting power. But it lost that persecuting power. It lost the civil arm, because the papacy rarely killed anybody directly. It always had a king do it, See? a prince. Somebody in the state would always do the killing for them. But a certain 
time and history, they lost that power and nobody's following their orders to kill people anymore as far as the state is concerned. Okay, with that little bit, I want to read something from Great Controversy. Page 565. Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than at any former period in our history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world. to regain control of the world, to re-establish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Now, I hope you realize that when I say something about current events, that I'm not talking politics. I'm not concerned about politics. Don't put me as a Republican or a Democrat or a Liberty or what, anything. Because I'm not concerned with that. But are you tuning in that the next person to be put forward as a Supreme Court judge is a Roman Catholic? Does that mean anything to you? How many of them on the Supreme Court are already Catholics? How many in Congress are Catholics? I think it might surprise us to, to find out. I'm not talking politics. I'm trying to stay where the Bible is talking and the spirit of prophecy. We have been warned about all these things. And if we keep thinking it's going to come someday, we're looking the wrong way. It's already here. It's here now. The move is being made. The worldwide... Fulfillment of the prophecies are happening. It does not apply to Israel in a literal way. It does not mean Palestine. It does not mean the river Euphrates. We're talking about something that's going on in the world spiritually. For 6,000 years we have been here. Now, that's a weird thing to say to most people, but we've been here about 6,000 years. When Jesus comes, this earth will be empty and void for another 1,000 years. What happens in the 8,000th year? The new life, okay. The new world, the new life. So the numbers are holding here. Turn with me to Colossians, the second chapter, and let's notice something. Verse 11. We'll start with verse 10. You are complete in Him. which is the head of all principality and power. It's hard for me not to stay with that one verse. You are complete in Him. It doesn't say you have to keep trying to get something. It says you are already complete in Him. Verse 11, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. What is that? Spiritual, isn't it? The heart. Nothing literal going on here. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism. Well, wait a minute. We have just been told here by Paul 
that circumcision and baptism are the same sign. What's baptism? You need water for baptism. Notice what he says here. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, what? All trespasses. How many? Do you have any left? Well, how come you're so downtrodden? Why do you look so moping around? My Bible says He has forgiven you. Oh. All <laughs> oh, trespasses. Have you been baptized? Well, that was a sign that you've been forgiven all your trespasses. Okay? Just as though you had been circumcised. It takes water. Now, Peter goes a little bit further. First Peter, the third chapter, verse 20. Verse 19 says that Jesus went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Who are the spirits in prison? It's all the lost people. <laughs> the churches try to say he went down into hell to do this and talk to spirits. No, no, no. The spirits in this verse are living people. Anybody who's lost is in prison. So it says, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. They had the same problem, didn't they? While the ark was preparing, wherein few. Now, what was happening with Noah? Does anything come to mind about water? <laughs> now, notice what he says here. Paul said circumcision, water, baptism. Peter is saying water, Noah. And notice what he says. Wherein few, that is, how many? Eight souls were saved by water. There's your number eight. God started a new world, a new life with the number eight. We are going to start seeing something very consistent here. Luke, the second chapter, verse 21. Two twenty one. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. Savior. Jehovah is Savior. That's what Jesus means. Yeah, for sure. When was he circumcised? On the eighth day. Circumcision is eight. Noah's new world is eight. Baptism is eight. Your new life. Your covenant relationship. Now, there is a scientific reason why people are about to, uh, excuse me, are circumcised on the eighth day. There's a thing in chemistry called prothrombin. It is your blood clotting mechanism or chemical. And it is in the greatest amounts and efficiency in the male child on the eighth day of his life. So God set things up so that people wouldn't bleed to death on the eighth day. And every male child that was circumcised on the eighth day began his new life with God, his covenant relationship with God on the eighth day. 
The first day of the week is mentioned eight times. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> On the eighth, eight times, and you might want to remember why. When you talk to people and they want to know about the first day of the week, Sunday, six of those mentions are about the day of Jesus' resurrection. One is in Acts, the 20th chapter, verse 7, where a man fell out of a window and died, and Paul raised him back to life in the Spirit. And the last one is in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says to set your books in order and set something aside from your money so that we can send it to the saints when I come. I don't want to take up collections when I come here. You had this done before I get here. Okay? Eight references. Now, I want you to really tune into that because the Pope, in his message to the world that Sunday is the new Sabbath, said eight means Sunday is the Sabbath. That's what he said. And you're going to hear this from the Protestant churches because... Jesus was crucified on the sixth day. He rested on the seventh day. And he was resurrected on the eighth day, which makes eight the number you want to pay attention to, according to the Pope. <laughs> Don't you get trapped. The Pope wants you to think that the eighth day is set aside for the resurrection because he's got something waiting for this world. It was only the eighth day in that year. The real numbers are in the Jewish calendar. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? Now, an Abi, the 14th, when Jesus was crucified, the next year it wasn't a Friday. Which means the next year it wasn't Sunday. Every year it shifts. It's always the 14th, 15th, and 16th, according to the Jewish calendar. But through the weekly cycle, every year it's different. So there is no reason to pick out a weekly day to do something. All right, I won't get into that right now. I just want you to be forewarned. The Pope's going to pull it on you that Sunday is the eighth day, always. You be ready. How many times a year was the wave sheaf waved? One time, right? How come the churches <coughs> want to make a weekly cycle out of it? <laughs> the Jewish economy will not support what the Protestant churches are trying to do today. How many times did they do the sacrifices? Every day. <laughs> so why should you pick one day of the week for that? There is nothing in the system that God gave to the Hebrews that will support apostate Protestantism in their views. Nothing. How come the churches celebrate Easter? Where is that found? And you can go on and on. It's just not there. All right, let's go on. I've got a lot of ground to cover today. I've got to keep moving here. The New Testament was written by how many writers? You're going to get good at this pretty soon. Eight writers. <laughs> okay. Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, 
James, Peter and Jude. The church is called a woman. There's a pure church and there's a false church. Okay, or an impure church. The real church, the woman, is mentioned eight times. Because it is a resurrection church. Okay? It is spiritual. It is Israel, the true Israel. The counterfeit church is found mentioned in Revelation 17 as a woman. Guess how many times? Six times. <laughs> These numbers will start talking to us after a while. Six times. That imperfect man. Now, let's get back to God's system. Jesus is called the Son of God in the book of John eight times. But his favorite title for himself was the Son of Man. And that is found in the New Testament... 88 times. And the last time, let's see. Yeah, the last time is in Revelation 14, Adventist country, where it deals with the harvest. We'll talk about the harvest in just a moment here. David was the eighth son of Jesse. <laughs> yeah. And Solomon was the eighth son of David. You are familiar with Second Peter, the, the steps? Second Peter, the fifth chapter. Faith, virtue, knowledge. You know the steps. There are eight of those. The eight steps to the kingdom of heaven. The ladder. In the acts of the Holy Spirit in the early church. The Sabbath is mentioned specifically eight times. So the number seven is going to be linked with the number eight. And I'll try to get to that before we're done today. I found an interesting thing. Paul does not use the word sabbatismus all the time. He uses another word. It's also found in Mark and Matthew. Katapausus, which, which does not mean I will give you rest like it says in the King James. The word actually means I will rest you. I will rest you. Now, I know what would happen if God gave me the rest and say, now you do something with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> and so he never says, I will give you my Sabbath rest. Now you do something. No, he says, I will rest you. I'm going to get this done. Oh. Now, obviously, this requires some cooperation. <laughs> but we must understand where the power is coming from. Who's really doing what? He uses that word, katapausis, eight times. <laughs> and in the book of Hebrews, which the scholars today say was not written by Paul, but I'm sorry, they're going to find out it. it. Even though he may not have written it with his own little stylus, he dictated that book. And somebody wrote it down for him. It was Paul's thoughts. It was him. And he talks in that book of eight better things. Eight better things. What are some of those better things? Uh, if you're writing notes, I'll give you a little bit more to work with here. In uh, Hebrews 6, 9... That's where he begins by saying things. 
719 hope that's a better thing we have a better hope in uh, 8 6 covenant and also in 8 6 promises okay. there's two th two there in 9 23 sacrifices Ten thirty four substance. Ten thirty four substance. Uh, Eleven sixteen. A better country. And eleven thirty five. The eighth one is resurrection. <laughs> he uses the word number eight. Is a better resurrection. Now, in the Old Testament, we find the same thing. When a, a leper wanted to be cleansed, if the Lord had actually physically healed him, he had to take himself before the priests. He was not considered cleansed until the priests went through their ceremonies. For seven days, he presented himself on the eighth day he was considered cleansed. He could begin his new life on the eighth day. And the same for the priests themselves. They were consecrated through a period of seven days, but they couldn't do their work until they reached the eighth day, their new life. So the number eight is consistent running all the way through here. Abraham. Had God approach him in a covenant relationship eight times. The eighth time was after Isaac was killed in figure. <laughs> okay? So, when he was, came down that mountain, he's still alive. It was like a resurrection. And God made the eighth covenant with Abraham after the resurrection. <laughs> Elijah, how many miracles do you think he did? <laughs> okay. I'll give you the miracles he did. The first one, he said, no more rain. He shut the heavens. The second one, the poor widow made the last cake for him and said, now I'm going to die. I said, no, I'll go back there again and see what's in there. <laughs> okay? The second miracle, the, the meal. And after she had taken care of him and put her own life in jeopardy and done everything God told her, she was rewarded by having her son die. <laughs> And so Elijah said, No, Lord, no, this can't be. What's she going to think about all of this? If this is the way she's treated after she's been so good to us. <laughs> Bring the life back, Lord. Bring that life back. That was the third miracle. Life came back. And then we see him up on the mountain. Fire from heaven. That's the fourth one. But that just didn't happen once. Then the rain came. And then fire again in 2 Kings, the first chapter, verse 10. And then fire again in, in 2 Kings, uh, verse 12. And now we're up to number 8. What was the eighth miracle? He went through the water and began his new life. <laughs> Number eight. <laughs> when God does something, He keeps doing it. He wants us to understand something. In the book of John, there are eight miracles recorded for Jesus. And the book of John is to show that Jesus is God. 
I don't know how many churches out there are now teaching that Jesus is a created being. It's amazing that anybody could ever get to that. But Jesus did eight miracles in the book of John. The first one involves water. <laughs> he turned that water into some nice healthful beverage there, fruit of the vine. The second miracle, the nobleman's son was healed. Then the impotent man was healed. And the fourth miracle is the feeding of the multitude. And then he walked on water. He healed the blind man. And he brought Lazarus back to life. And what do you suppose the eighth miracle involves? A hundred and fifty-three fishes out of the water after his resurrection. <laughs> Always after resurrection. In Genesis, the fifth chapter, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them. He blessed them and he called their name Adam. It didn't say his name. Their name, Adam. And Adam lived 130 years, begot a son in his own image, a likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he'd begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, where'd you set to Genesis 5? This is the man that's supposed to live forever. And he died. And then it lists who was born after that. And it says, and he died. And then who was born after that. And he died. Guess how many of them are in that chapter? <laughs> eight. And he dies. That number eight is screaming for a resurrection. And he died. And he died. And he died. In the book of Matthew, there are generations listed. The answer is found right there to Genesis 5, 8. What is 5 times 8? 40? The 40th generation is Jesus Christ. <laughs> 5 times 8. These are not accidents. The Bible is full of these kinds of things. Bethlehem, the place where Jesus is born, is mentioned eight times in the New Testament. Now I want to take you through something that I have mentioned in the past, but now I'm going to detail it for you so you really see what it means. In Revelation, the first chapter, the first eight quotations have a message for us. But you are not going to see the first eight quotations because it doesn't list them normally. Few people know about it, and it's not in very many references, but I want to take you through it just now. Revelation, the first chapter, I think what I'll do is write them down so we can refer to them on the board here so you can see them. Isaiah. That's in Revelation 1.6.
one seven That's also seven. Uh, one eight. Now, I want you to notice something because you may not be writing this correctly. You must write it this way. This Isaiah here and then Daniel coming in. And then Zechariah coming in. And then Isaiah coming in. You must write it this way. Okay. Okay, now we have them all. I'm glad I did that because this will make it easier for us to understand what happens once we start talking about it. Now, you will notice they come in like this. And between 8 and 11, here there are no more, no more quotations. I mean, yes, verse 10, there's nothing there. That's not a quote. And then it starts up again. Isaiah, Zechariah, Dan. Isaiah coming this way. Once you've got that all written down, I will try to explain why those scriptures are written like that. In the Ten Commandments, these words are found in the center. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jehovah thy God. That's the middle of the Ten Commandments. That is the center of the Ten Commandments. In the Jewish economy, that is the center of obedience. Right there. The Sabbath of Jehovah. There are two elements there that God has put in the middle of the Ten Commandments. His name and the memorial of His creation. Jehovah.
There are eight books quoted here. There are actually four, aren't there? They're repeated. And you'll notice how they're repeated. Isaiah is up here and down here. Then you come in and the next book is Daniel at both ends. Coming in both sides. Then the next book quoted is Zechariah and Zechariah down here. And then Isaiah is quoted and Isaiah is quoted in the middle. But you are exactly the same. Why did God do that? Why are these quotes around verse 10? Why does all of this come like this to verse 10? Do you think God's trying to tell us something about verse 10? <laughs> Well, what do these quotes say? We'll just look at Isaiah, the middle ones, for right now. Let's look at those and see. Isaiah 41, verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginnings? I, the Jehovah. Do you see in your Bible the capital letters L-O-R-D? That's the Tetragrammaton. That is the name of God, Jehovah. I, the Jehovah, the first with the last, I am He. So according to Isaiah, who is the first and the last, the I am? Jehovah. Let's go to 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Jehovah, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Jehovah of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. The first and the last is the Redeemer. The King, Jehovah. Forty-eight, verse twelve. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, I called. I am He. I am. The first, I also am the last. What is John doing here? <laughs> Why did he do that? He's proving Jesus is Jehovah. Now this ought to just absolutely wipe out the Jehovah's Witnesses' minds. They've never seen this. <laughs> it ought to do the same to lots of people. They don't know Jesus is Jehovah. How come they don't know? What's in verse 10? Let's go look at verse 10. <laughs> Revelation 1.10. Let's see what it says there.
<laughs> now this has been here the whole time. When John put down the revelation, this was right there. It's been there for 2,000 years. I have never heard an evangelist use this. It's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. Revelation 110. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. All right, tell me what that word Lord means. I was in the spirit on Jehovah's day. The Jehovah. And John, to be sure we knew what was being talked about, put it on both sides of that verse. I am Jehovah, the first and the last, the king, your redeemer, your creator. How do you get Sunday out of that? He's hardly begun the book and he's pointed out Jesus is Jehovah. Now who doesn't like that? The devil doesn't like it. That's the great controversy. <laughs> The devil said, I will worship the Father, but I will not worship Jesus. Jesus is just like me. That's a bad echo I hear somewhere. <laughs> the great controversy. Who is Jesus? John's answering him. He's answering that great controversy in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Jehovah's day. Jesus, the Creator. Sabbath. And so the great controversy all of a sudden can be seen here because in the very center of all these quotations that show that Jesus is the commander, the leader, the king, the redeemer, the creator, Jehovah. Is the Sabbath. I would invite you to look at Exodus 20 with me for just a second. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jehovah. <laughs> do you see that in your Bible? It's capitalized. It's the tetragrammaton. The Jehovah, thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, nor thy cattle, your animals. Yeah, God says, don't you treat your animals bad. We're teaching mercy here. You give them Sabbath. Your animals. Verse 11, for in six days the Jehovah made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in the midst, rest of the seventh day, wherefore the Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So right there in the middle of the Ten Commandments, three times God says, the Jehovah, the Sabbath. And John does it here. Eight quotes the Jehovah Sabbath, the center of this setting right here. 
This is how he begins the book of Revelation and the whole rest of the book is dealing with this. Jesus, the Jehovah, and the Sabbath is the issue. The whole great controversy is right here. Who is Jesus? What is the Sabbath? There it is. We run out of time here. There are eight descriptions of the Son of Man following immediately that. It talks about his clothing, his head and hair. It talks about his eyes, his feet. It talks about his voice, his right hand, his mouth, and his countenance. We as Seventh-day Adventists know that only the Creator can be the Redeemer. It takes Creator power to say. And now I better finish what I said earlier. The 88th time Revelation 14:14, 14, 14, Jesus is called the Son of Man is right out to the third angel's message. And it has to deal with the harvest. The harvest. The word harvest in Greek is hotheramos. That word in the Greek has the value of 704. The harvest. That's the resurrection time, the harvest. 704 is 8 times 88. It is the resurrection number. So, let's finish what we're doing today. Let's read Revelation 17, 11 again. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. Does everybody have this? I'm going to erase this. Okay, I'll leave it on for a sec. Yeah, this was in the way here. Okay. Okay. Maybe I won't erase it. I'll just go ahead and say it. It's, it's not capitalized in Greek, no. No, it's just in the Hebrew. We need the Hebrew ones to see the capitalization. That's why he has all those quotes. Now, you go back sometime and you read all these verses. Study out these verses because these are describing who Jehovah is and what His power is. Okay? And when you've got all that, remember that the way God did this is Isaiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Daniel, Zechariah, Zechariah, Isaiah, Isaiah, verse 10. <laughs> it puts you right into that verse. Okay? The number eight means resurrection, always, new life. So let's look at Revelation 17, 11 a little bit here. It says the beast that was and is, and there's more descriptions of it, Revelation 13 and beyond here too. But the part we want to know is that number eight. He's the eight of the seven. Well, let's make up our minds here. Either he's the eighth one or he's the seventh one. <laughs> what God has done here, if we can understand the number eight correctly, is thrown in a symbol after he's dealt with literal numbers. What are the literal numbers? One, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
the numbers run out. So why did God say eight? He says the sixth one is not. If the sixth one is a persecuting power known as a papacy, it is not right now. Today, it is not. It is not a persecuting power. But it says, but will be. Will be what? Alive again. It will be resurrected. And when it is resurrected, it will be number seven. It will be a persecuting power again. Now, Jesus died and was resurrected. This woman, this beast, dies and has a counterfeit resurrection. A counterfeit resurrection. And then the Bible says, the world wondered after the beast. How did this dead thing come back to life again? How did the Catholic Church become the persecuting power on earth again? Who can make war with the beast? It's just around the corner. The Catholic Church is on the move. It's doing silently what Protestants don't even guess is going on. But we as Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to understand this book. We're supposed to know what these numbers mean. We're supposed to know how to interpret the Bible, the first and the last. Repetition. Enlargement. Names. All of it. And when we can understand the Bible through God's method of interpretation, we will be the third angel people. And we'll have something to say. We will give a loud cry. People try to tell me we're in the, they're experiencing the latter rain. Come on, folks. The latter rain is a loud cry. All I hear is squeaking. Oh, I don't hear any loud cries. The loud cry is a loud cry. Nobody can shut it out when it comes. We need to be getting ready for that loud cry. But we are not going to give the loud cry until we have matured in the harvest. And God seals us and does all that He said He was going to do with His people. I hope this kind of a thing encourages you to know God is serious. <laughs> He's going to do what he says. He has put this in so many places and so many ways. We haven't found them all yet. <laughs> the book of Daniel is full of this kind of stuff. I didn't say Revelation. I said the book of Daniel. <laughs> okay, let's get in there. All of us have great controversies. Let's start reading that book. That book says things we haven't understood yet. Let's get in. Let's dig. Let's ask the Lord to reveal it to us. And then more than that, let's ask Him to wake us up and turn a fire on so we can start talking to people and sharing who Jesus is. Okay. We will not have a meeting next week. We're going to have a uh, camp meeting, I guess, here. So we won't have a... Uh, I guess that's for two weeks, so we won't have a meeting here for two weeks. Just the one? So they're going to be... Okay, that's, that'll work out fine. All right, next week, no meeting, and I, we'll be back at 3 o'clock next time. Okay, let's up for... Father, we thank you that as limited as we are and as weak as we are, that Jesus paid the full price already. We have been redeemed. Help us to understand that good news, that we don't contribute anything to it. We never will. It was between you and your son. 
You're satisfied. Help us, Lord, to believe it. Help us to live in it. Help us to grow in it. And help us to know that you've given us the privilege of developing a character that will honor you. We're going to weep often because we see how badly we're doing. That we're really a mess. But we thank you that that mess is already in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to move forward, to trust in such a way that your power will work in us. That we won't be looking at self anymore. We'll be an empty vessel. But we will sense your power working to help someone else. We thank you for your word. That sure word that can never fail. May we understand it more clearly. And as we do see things more clearly. May we follow without hesitation. We thank you. In Jesus holy name. Amen.